गुड मॉर्निंग विलास हेलो गुड मॉर्निंग हाउ आर यू या आई एम फाइन हाउ आर यू ऑल राइट एवरीथिंग इज गोइंग वेल गुड मॉर्निंग विलास सुप्रभात सुप्रभात Good morning, sir. Good morning. Hello, Iman. Iman. Good morning, sir. Good Hello. Morning. How, are How are you in Iraq? I'm I'm fine. Thank you so much. I'm happy to see you in the conference. Yes, I'm happy to join the conference. Thank you so much. Okay. So we'll wait for a few more minutes and then we can start. Right? Okay, no problem. गुड मॉर्निंग वन एंड ऑल मैडम गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग शैल वी स्टार्ट नाउ ओके वी शुड स्टार्ट राइट यस जस्ट फ्यू फ्यू मिनट्स वेट आर एक्जेक्टली 9:30 वी विल स्टार्ट ओके सर पीपल आर जॉइनिंग people are joining okay वेलकम मिस्टर पुकार रत्ति एंड डॉक्टर पॉल थैंक यू वेलकम मिस्टर पुकार रत्ति एंड डॉक्टर पॉल गुड मॉर्निंग थैंक यू Good evening, Dr. Professor Paul and uh, Mr. Pukar Ratti. Thank you so much for the invite. Oh, welcome, Mr. Pukar Ratti and uh, Dr. Paul. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Professor Paul and uh, Mr. Pukar Ratti. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invite. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, 
will start in two minutes only. Miss Mayuri. Yes, sir. You take charge of mic now. Yes, sir. Sure. Sir. So who are the audience we are expecting here? Uh, the audience is faculty members as well as students from different faculties. So commerce, arts and science? Science, technology also. All right. Good to know who is the who are the audience so that uh, accordingly we can talk. I, I, I will I will take a brief review in the beginning of it. All right, sounds like a good plan. Good morning, Pavarati. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, yes. Good morning, Paul, sir. Okay. Good morning. So, yes, yes. We'll start at 9.30. Okay. So most of students, they are waiting for them. That works. Okay. Sir, I think we are good to start now. Uh, yes, yes. You can start now. Okay. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen, respected dignitaries, my dear colleagues, and all my dear students. My name is Professor, Assistant Professor Mayuri Moreshwar Desli from Department of Commerce. It takes me immense pleasure to formally welcome you to the Virtual International Conference on Innovative Thinking in Science and Technology, organized by IQAC and Institute's Innovation Council, Yashwantra Mohiti College of Arts, Science and Commerce, Bharti Vidyapit, deemed to be University, Pune. To kickstart with this conference, I would request Dr. R.S. Dirange, IQAC Coordinator, Head of PG Department in English, to throw the light on the theme of this conference and brief about IQSC and Inno Institute's Innovation Council. Dr. R.S. Dirange, sir. Thank you, Ms. Mayuri. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, from uh, two different parts of the world. Uh, today's conference is uh, a venture uh, in this uh, pandemic situation, critical situation. And uh, at the outset, I really appreciate the consents uh, from the both the speakers to share their views uh, in this regard. Uh, <clears throat> from the point of view of the opening remarks of the conference, uh, in the present situation, the Indian higher education system is on the brink of great transformation to cope up with global competency. The overall concern of higher education is the main concern in the policy, new policy framing, uh, which has come out uh, during uh, 2020, that new education policy. Uh, the internal quality assurance sale of the college has always aimed to work towards quality sustenance and enhancement of the academic and the administrative performance of the institution. One of the important initiatives of IPSC is the implementation of learning outcome-based curriculum framework uh, in 2018 as per the UGC guidelines. Uh, 
internal quality assurance sale has been an instrumental for organizing national and international academic events in the college. The IQAC has always provided a platform for uh, the stakeholders to share their views, to strengthen pedagogy, as well as the feedback mechanism. The Ministry of Education, Government of India's uh, Innovation Sale, MIC, has envisioned encouraging creation of Institutions Innovation Council across the selected higher education institutions in India. And fortunately, our college is one of them and we have very active Institutions Innovation Council. The Innovation Council aims to encourage, inspire and nurture the young talents critical thinking and transform that into new ideas as well as convert it into prototype in the initial stage. It's our venture to organize this academic event in such critical situation. Uh, regarding something, I try to uh, throw light on the concept of innovation. And innovation is an idea that has been transformed into practical reality. Innovation means to improve or to replace something, for example, the process, a product or service. Innovation is a process by which a domain, a product or a service is renewed and brought up to the day, uh, brought up to the date by applying new processes, introducing new techniques and establishing successful ideas to create new value. Critical thinking is directed. I am talking about now critical thinking. Uh, for two uh, sentences, critical thinking is directed towards the conceiving something original or unusual, while innovative thinking is for implementing the creative ideas to develop something new that has a value to people, society and a nation at large. With creative thinking, problems can be solved differently and strategically. The right innovative technique can help you save precious time and money and give you competitive lead in, the expand in expanding your business. Uh, there are four competencies of the innovator and these are creativity, critical thinking, strategic thinking and problem, uh, problem solving. And today we are very fortunate that we have both the speakers, very experienced innovative thinkers who have proved their qualities and hence occupied the prestigious position in promising land called United States of America. I formally uh, welcome both the speakers at on this occasion and uh, I conclude my speech here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zirangi. This must have definitely increased the curiosity of our participants for today's conference, right? Now may I invite our in-charge principal, Dr. S.R. Patil, Dean Faculty of Science to deliver the welcome address. Principal, sir. Sir, you need to admit, sir. Sir, you need to admit. Sir, please admit yourself. Patil, sir, unmute yourself and start. Good morning to one and all. 
chief guest of eminent speaker of today's international conference honorable kukar reddy system director research and academics texas united states of america our another speaker honorable dr vilas pool professor davidson sir mic band hai mic band hai ke bhi itna hai kya ियरिंगूनिवर्सिटी युनाइट स्टेट ऑफ अमेरिका honorable chancellor of bharti devet dimto university professor dr shivara kadam vice chancellor professor dr manik rao sarnke and pro vice chancellor and minister of state of maharashtra government dr vishwit kadam sent best wishes to this international conference and will shortly our vice chancellors will be joined our iqsa coordinator dr jhirenge conference coordinator dr mrs supriya shukla convener dr mrs sharda gadale members of organizing committee all the faculty members delegates research scholars and all my dear students who are participate in this international conference as the in charge principal of this college i extend you very all very hearty welcome at the outset let me acquaint you with some of the achievement of this college the nac has reaccredited our university and its 29 constituents with the most prestigious a grade our university also a grade university status by mhrd government of india this college is established in the year 1978 the college is named in honor of past president sri eshwantrao moite he is known as philosopher social and political thinker since its establishment and almost for 17 years the college was affiliated to pune university and in the year 1996 it becomes the constituent unit of bharati vidyapeeth deemed to be nos along with this outstanding academic achievement we have outstanding success in sports also in 16 of our students sports students have won prestigious shiv chatrapati award atul pete upendra leme pravin tarde padmasri sheetal majan champion akanksha hagavne famous cricketer player mr kedar jadhav are some of the our alumni the college organizes all cultural activities under the banner of kala bharati our students have been the winner of most prestigious purushottam karandak kirudya karandak and general championship of university youth festival sir every year the all departments of college organizes national and international seminar conferences workshops and we have prestigious to see that the vice chancellor of various universities scientists writers and poets to see as the chief guest of for the inaugural sessions this is my proud privilege to mention that we have more than 98 foreign students from 14 countries of the world and 155 students from various indian states of the last year as soon as we came under the dinged university we went ahead with pg courses as one of the date we offer pg degree in the subject of chemistry microbiology computer science english economics commerce and library sciences research is backbone of any institute research has been one of the major activities of the college as on the date 100 plus of students have completed their pg degree course with us almost all of our staff members have done their mphil and phd and have been actively engaged in research recently our faculty member submitted major research project to dst department of science technology and elo and we got near about 40 we receiving shortly 43 lakhs from the department of science technology similarly elo major and four minor research projects have been completed 
and that was funded by university grant commission ministry of environment forest national mediation plan board new delhi recently 2018 we issued grant of rupees 95 lakhs from dst fist from central government the supreme court of india has also referred our research conclusions in one of the is ruling thus our research finding and research finding have been proved as a defining elements and resulted into the removal of garbage depot at kot road in the pune city once again i extend you all a very hearty welcome and wish you all happy day thank you thank you very much thank you so much sir it is your continuous support that makes it possible for organizing such events talking about the conference our conference will have two sessions where our first session is on defying against covid-19 pandemic exceptionalism to innovate adapt and achieve research excellence during an abrupt global healthcare crisis hit in 2020 which will be delivered by our eminent speaker mr pukar ratti who is system director research and academics christus institute for innovation and advanced clinical care texas usa and our second session is on imagination for innovation which will be delivered by dr vilas kaur professor davidson school of chemical engineering purdue university west lafayette usa so without losing more time i would request dr s s shukla to introduce our first keynote speaker mr pukar ratti thank you madam uh, good morning all Uh, at the outset let me share with you uh, the participants so that uh, we all get an idea that who is the audience uh, for this part uh, for this conference we have total 622 registrations uh, received so far out of which we have majority from maharashtra and other states of india also and uh, the participants from other countries we have total 25 participants from other countries as well Uh, there are research scholars about uh, 50 research scholars are there uh, who have registered and the students are in majority about 499 students have registered from different uh, faculties from arts uh, commerce and science but we have majority from science also over here uh, so with this uh, i feel very honored uh, to introduce our first speaker mr pukar ratti uh, welcome sir uh, इरविन Keck Graduate Institute in Claremont, California, and Biocon Academy in Bangalore, India. He has over 20 years of progressive, frontline to executive experience in clinical research, academics, and healthcare. Academically, Pukar holds a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from University of Pune. a master of science degree in biochemistry and chemical engineering from university of south alabama and another in healthcare management from university of new orleans he is also a certified clinical research professional that is ccrp from society of clinical research associates and certified irb manager from national association of irb leaders additionally he is one of the few select healthcare leaders in the state of texas to hold fellowship with american college of medical practice executives thus so far he has led the conduct of more than 2000 multi multidisciplinary clinical trials and has served as faculty for more than 2000 international students as well he is a frequent speaker and presenter at major clinical research conferences and meetings at national and international levels both he has published a combination of 25 scientific peer reviewed journal papers and number of technical papers as well 
we welcome you sir for this session and i thank you for accepting our inv uh, our invitation uh, so we are from our, on behalf of our institute university and our bharti vidyapeet i welcome you to this uh, conference sir i request you to start your session please sir thank you so much for that warm welcome is my screen visible now yes yes sir it is yes so perfect um so as i said i'm really honored and humbled um to be in this group and i thank you from the bottom of my heart for this invitation i can truly feel the energy in this room um with the research scholars with the esteemed faculty and the um number of students who are attending this this podium so um our lecture today is on um defying against covid-19 pandemic exceptionalism to innovate adapt and achieve research excellence during an abrupt ongoing global healthcare crisis which was hit in 2020 now desperate times call for desperate measures and we all if we look around have been doing that since the onset of this pandemic that hit us in 2020 um our family meetings have turned to zoom meetings our kids we had never thought um would be homeschooling have been homeschooling for over a year folks who love shopping have turned to e-commerce and our love for food and trying different cuisines in in restaurants have turned to home deliveries so truly if you just look around our, our domestic environment we have displayed signs of innovation So our focus today will be looking at the same innovation seen in the scientific world. A couple of disclosures: um, I do not have formal training in medicine, and I do hold a couple of faculty appointments at UCI and Keck Graduate Institute. Here are the objectives for today's webinar. Um, we'll start out with describing the structure and the scope of the Christus Health Research Institute, how it is different from others, and the associated sophistication at our institution. <clears throat> I will then introduce you to the concept of COVID-19 pandemic exceptionalism and highlight the significance of this theoretical concept. We will then move on to describing the novel practices that were adopted by our research institute that have led us to innovate, adapt and achieve research excellence during this impending pandemic. And lastly, I'll use one of our research experiences as an illustration to prove the concept. So without further ado, so on our first topic, let's um talk a little bit about Christus Health. So Christus Health is one of the top 10 faith-based Catholic health systems in USA. We live by the mission to extend the healing ministry of Jesus Christ. We are headquartered in beautiful Irving, Texas in the Metroplex area of Dallas. We have international presence not just in USA but also in Latin American countries like Mexico, Chile, and Colombia. Overall we are serving over 600 locations. From the workforce standpoint, we are 45 45,000 associates strong, out of which we have over 15,000 physicians and uh, physician extenders as part of our team. Together, we touch over 6.3 million patient lives across all of our sites annually. and our financial well-being is to the count of over 8 billion dollars so in 2016 christus health decided to invest in centralizing its research operations this is where i had the opportunity of of moving to texas and take on this challenge as the executive for this envisioned research institute since then we have branded and centralized all of our services under Christus Institute for Innovation and Advanced Clinical Care um or abbreviated as CIAC. We are also headquartered in Irving, Texas and provide research operations largely to our US sites but also begun to provide support to our research operations in Mexico, Chile and Colombia. 
We provide centralized management to all of our research sites and the physicians who are engaged in research and provide unified research and regulatory oversight to their operations. Collectively in the US domain, we um, provide support to 28 acute care research locations. Um, together at this time, we have over 550 active clinical trials and research studies ongoing. Many of them, of course, at this time are focused on COVID-19. And in these 550 research studies, we have over 14,000 research subjects enrolled in them. So here's the geographic footprint of our um, institute. Um, you can see the state of New Mexico in yellow. Um, we have a site in Santa Fe. The green picture is of Texas. We can see we are scattered from Northeast Texas to South Texas to Southeast Texas in almost every city in those geographic domains. And to the right is the state of Louisiana, where also from North to South, we are catering cities like Shreveport, Alexandria, and Lake Charles. So it's a very large uh, geographic footprint. And smack in the middle is Dallas. The, the purple uh, oval that you are seeing is depicting our uh, headquarters. So it is unified at this time. We are trying to manage all of these operations through our centralized oversight system. And that creates a level of complexity and oversight um, because even though these uh, are under one umbrella, each of them are situated in different parts of the state and varying states. So to organize that, um, here is what our organization looks like. Um, down below, you can see the picture of our corporate headquarters. Um, so our first set of operations are under the Office of Human Resource Subjects Protection Program. This is where we provide centralized support for ethical review of all the research studies that we offer to our patients. This office also provides research educational opportunities um, and they also provide um, not just on an ongoing basis, but also the initial education. So our physicians and research staff are um, trained fully and most current to, um, to be prepared to, to uh, conduct these research opportunities. This office also has a very robust in-house research compliance program. Moving we'll on to the next office of sponsored programs and research finance. Um, here we offer services like pre-award um, that includes um, services to our physicians, um, such as um, reviews of clinical trial contracts, um, pre-budget negotiations, um, post-award services to include clinical research, a revenue cycle management uh, for services such as billing, invoicing, collections, payment posting, and payment reconciliation. Um, and this office thirdly also provides support for um, uh, finance, uh, financial reporting in terms of financial statements on a monthly basis, so we can keep an eye on the financial performance of our innovative activities. And the next two are the Christus Virtual Biobank and the Office of Investigator Support, which are overlapping offices and are merely the composition of the multitude of um, inside on-site uh, services that we offer at our hospitals. So this is where we have our research leaders, their teams of research coordinators, research nurses who are on-site working with the physicians to deliver the clinical trial implementation. We've adopted a hub, hub and spoke model. Um, so we can see SIAC in the middle uh, based in Irving. And we have divided our US domain in four different regions. To the left, you can see New Mexico that provides oversight to one hospital. Up is the Northeast Texas region providing support to nine different hospitals. To the right is Louisiana and Southeast Texas for five different acute care hospitals, and the largest in South Texas that provides support to um, 13 hospitals scattered um, in Deep South, um, cities like uh, Corpus Christi and San Antonio. We provide um, truly services when it comes to clinical trials from birth to burial, or you can say cradle um, to the coffin.
So literally from hunting for the studies which are the best fit for our patients that our physicians would be interested in, to doing their feasibility analysis, to performing ethical review, to, to get them activated, to help them implement, and then um, truly ensure that the data is generated and published appropriately. And when we look at the service level offerings, they come in three different tiers. So we have services coming from our ring office uh, at the corporate level. We have those regional hubs that provide services to the entire region. And then at the local level um, are also services available. These are hands-on services available to our physicians for conduct and implementation of clinical research studies. So let's move on to the next topic of COVID-19, pandemic exceptionalism. And we'll start with um, understanding the theory of exceptionalism. So what it means is, is merely a perception or a belief that something is exceptional, that it is unusual, or, or better said, it is extraordinary. And the something could be a specimen, it could be a nation, it could be a certain society in a specific country, or an institution, or a movement, individual, or a time period. Whenever we are talking about exceptionalism, we almost always will carry a connotation that what we are referring to is somewhat superior. So when we refer to something as exceptional, we are trying to imply that this country or this time period is superior over the others. And as we do that, we tend to exaggerate the appearance of difference. We, we try to artificially make, some, make this thing different than the others. So let's try to understand a little bit more about exceptionalism through a couple examples. So let's take um, one example where the concept is American exceptionalism. So this is a theory that United States is inherently different than all other nations on the globe, that it is seen as superior or have a unique mission to transform the world in its own way. Certainly I'm not intending to open the floor for a political debate, but that is what the concept of American exceptionalism is. It really puts America on a different pedestal over other countries um, because of a variety of parameters described um, just a moment ago. Since the topic today is mostly around medicine, um, let's take another example from the science of medicine, um, HIV exceptionalism. So ex HIV exceptionalists emphasize that the human rights of people living with HIV or AIDS, particularly um, their rights and privacy, confidentiality, and um, autonomy needs to be different. They also believe that all people seeking an HIV test um, always requires special set of services, such as counseling with every HIV test, special informed consent form paperwork, and guaranteed anonymity in public health reporting. In many places, it is illegal to disclose HIV test results over the phone or over the internet. But isn't HIV just another contagious disease like flu? So why treat it as exceptional? But nonetheless, the scientific community, the political community, and the general masses treat this contagious disease, which is yet another one, in an exceptional manner. And that is how um, the theory of concept, uh, exceptionalism applies to different um, situations. So let's talk a little bit about COVID-19 pandemic. So this is caused by Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, Coronavirus Type 2, or SARS-CoV-2. World Health Organization declared this as a pandemic since March 2020. As we all know, it is still currently ongoing. The symptoms of this um, disease can range from something which may be nothing or asymptomatic to somebody on a life ventilator fighting for their life 
as a life-threatening situation. As of today, every nation, almost all of the 200 nations on our planet have been impacted by this pandemic. Numerically speaking, um, I ran these numbers last week, over 110 million recorded cases we have on file and many more um, which may be un not recorded on files. Off of these, about half of them to the tune of 62.2 million cases have been recovered. And there are 2.44 million and counting deaths um, across the globe. United States just reached this morning its half million death toll, which is pretty um, disturbing. What this pandemic has done has shown us times that we have not seen in our lifetimes. We are seeing unprecedented travel restrictions. I know my family had tra made travel plans for a big vacation last summer. That's down the drain. And that must be a story for so many masses around the globe. That we are seeing unprecedented lockdowns. United Kingdom is uh, trying to unlock, uh, unlock it's one of the severe lockdowns this week. We've seen new processes for workplace hazard controls. Facilities and many businesses have been closed around the globe. We have supply chain disruption creating supply shortages in almost every sector from food to pharmaceuticals to, to everything else in between. There are political topics around the globe. We've seen also cases of xenophobia, which is the fear for foreigners. There are certain cases of racism and racial events uh, also have happened around the globe um, against countries like China and Italy which is not what our um, humanity is set to be doing, but such are the times of the COVID-19 pandemic. Here's a diagram I have taken from visualcapitalist.com. And um, what you are seeing here is a timeline of, um, of decades since um, the dawn of time, since we have records, and this is displaying the different varieties of pandemics that have hit our globe. So there are 20 of them. It starts way back in 165 to 180 AD, when the first ever recorded pandemic had hit, and it was called Antonine Plague. It killed, back then, 5 million people. Of course, these are estimates. Um, the second one was the plague of Justinian uh, that killed 30 to 50 million people back in 541 to 542 in just a span of one year. Another example is the Black Death, the bubonic plague, the largest of all from 1347 to 1351 in four years that killed ever recorded most number of uh, population around the globe to the tune of 200 million. And then we fast forwarded from smallpox to 17th century great plague, to the third plague, to the yellow fever, to the HIV AIDS, to SARS, to the MERS, to COVID-19, um, as shown with the um, red star down below on this slide. So COVID-19 um, is the 20th pandemic that has been recorded in history. If you look at the incidence rates of these pandemics, it's very interesting. We can see from zero to the 19th century. So in 1900 years, there were only 11 pandemics that hit us. In the 19th century, there were four. In the 20th century, another four. In the 21st century, COVID-19 is the fifth pandemic already. And this is, we're just starting the year 21. At this rate, are we going to see 25 pandemics by the end of this century? Hope not. So with that, let's take another look at the death toll um, of these pandemics. So these uh, fluffy balls kind of represent by their size, the number of deaths that they caused. Um, looking at this ranking, COVID-19, which is in the red box, is number nine at this time. Of course, it's an ongoing pandemic. Um, I think it will jump up a couple more spots, hopefully not, but it has the potential um, whereby it's already at 2.2 million. 
million. And then the next largest um, pandemic was the 17th century Great Plague at 3 million. It's possible that this pandemic may bump that. Um, if you just look at the last 100 years, Spanish flu was number one, HIV AIDS number two, and COVID-19 is number three. So that's another disturbing statistic. Let's take a look at infectiousness of these diseases. Um, so the measure of infectiousness is also referred to as a reproduction number or R0 or R0. It is defined as a number which tells us how many susceptible people on average each sick person in turn will infect. So here, the ranking of COVID-19 from top to the bottom is number six. If you look at the example of measles, which is the worst of all, one measles patient can infect 16 unvaccinated uh, patients or, or, or people around them. Compared to that, COVID-19 um, is somewhat better. It infects 2.5 people around them in unvaccinated population. It still is a disturbing number for COVID-19 to be at number six spot. Of course, the older pandemics, this measure, this data is not available. That is why um, we only have this on nine of the 20 pandemics. So COVID-19 exceptionalism. Why is it exceptional? Well, it is, for starters, it is a pandemic of the most modern times that we know. At this time, there is widespread globalization. You could literally have your breakfast in San Francisco, get on flight, um, be in uh, Frankfurt just in time for your lunch, and hopefully be in India for your home-cooked dinner. World has come that close. Also in this day and age, we have best in class clinical research infrastructure. If we could, we, we have all the tools, resources, literature, uh, personnel, and the knowledge out and about to tackle any pandemic that, that we uh, may be hit. This pandemic also has hit the world economies the worst known. And there's also associated heightened political pressure and this large public outcry associated with this pandemic. But with that also comes a lot of ethical dilemma. While we wanna take measures for urgency, can we justify reducing the quality of research studies to generate evidence quickly? So literally reducing the quality to speed up the time, that is not the right way to do it. Can we have myopic decision-making without imagination, foresight, or intellectual insight, and merely stay focused on short-term goals from scientific research? Another no. Another set of um, ethical dilemma comes with the use of placebo. So placebo is, um, so, in, in scientific world, um, the gold standard is to design clinical trials um, using randomized control trials, which is where you are designing clinical trials where one patient would get, um, in a randomized manner, access to the investigational product. That is what you are studying. That may be a drug or a device or a biologic or a vaccine. And another patient uh, in a randomized manner may get a placebo. This may merely be a look-alike drug. It may just be like a sugar pill. And, um, but, but when we're talking about a life-threatening disease like COVID-19 pandemic, can we afford to give patients placebo, put their life at risk because the randomized controlled clinical trials are best um, designed clinical trials? Another topic to scratch our heads. Moving on, poor quality studies. Can we have small sample sizes? So sample size is um, how many um, patients you would be um, placing or enrolling in your clinical trial. Can we just, so for example, can we do a study on 50 patients for a COVID-19 vaccine study and expect the results of that study to get approval for that vaccine? And then we make it available to 7.8 billion population around the globe. That would not be the right thing to do. 
we have to balance the sample sizes. Again, we cannot wait until half a million patients are enrolled in clinical trials, but there has to be a common ground we have to meet. Use of invalidated surrogate endpoint and lack of randomization or blind blinding are other topics of ethical dilemma that come along. So here is a graph, which is, I apologize, somewhat uh, difficult to read, but this was the best I could um, kind of snippet uh, for my slide. It is coming from STAT um, from July 6, 2020. So this was just a few months into the um, pandemic. And um, I'd like to highlight the case of research chaos through this illustration. So when you look at these numbers, um, what this slide is summarizing is by this time, by early July, how many clinical trials were ongoing to study COVID-19? And there were over 1,200 studies. Together, these 1,200 studies were anticipating enrollment of 685,000 patients across the globe. Now, if you zoomed this number closely, the largest bubble that you see on the right-hand side in my graph, this one here, um, that is depicting 200 of the 1,200, or in other words, one in every six of these clinical trials was focused on studying hydroxychloroquine. And these 200 studies were anticipating enrollment of over 237,000 patients, or roughly 35% of the 685,000 patients that would be enrolled in the 1,200 studies. Now, that's a disturbing metric. I would say this would be an example of myopic vision of scientists around the globe. While the times were desperate, so, you know, while in hindsight we can say, oh my gosh, why so many scientists focused on a drug for which we had so little evidence back then, and they ended up opening 200 studies. Um, hydroxychloroquine for um, folks who don't know is the anti-malarial drug um, used for treatment of malarial patients. Um, and it had shown in a very small study early on last summer, the potential to possibly um, do a difference for COVID-19 patients. We all know that the results um, yield did not um, good results and that this drug was taken off our, our dream list. Um, but at this desperate time, the research I would say was disordered. It was, why was the focus more on hydroxychloroquine research? It really shows the disorganized manner in which the scientific community around the globe was, um, was doing the work. Obviously there were associated wasted resources and not to mention the delay in scientific evidence. Had they split and begun to do research on different investigational products, maybe we would have had more treatment options available for the sickest of patients around the globe. Maybe, maybe not. So as a matter of balance, as we try to put things in perspective, I believe this is what we get to see, an imbalanced scale. On the left, we see lighter side of the knees. What we want is to save as many lives as we can. And we gotta do this urgently. We gotta do it today as soon as possible. But on the right hand side are all the facts we are fighting with. It's the uncertainty. It's the novelty of disease and the limited resources available at the disposal of any nation out there. So the ray of hope that I want to show you here is one of the examples of Operation Warp Speed. In a picture on the slide, you can see our former President Donald Trump um, in the White House Rose Garden, formally announcing the Operation Warp Speed. This was one of the unique, unprecedented programs rolled out in the United States, um, and this was um, in May of 2020. This was the first time we were able to bring together the public and private sectors, entities like NIH, National Institutes of Health, uh, CDC, and others, and private entities like the Pfizer and Regeneron and Sanofi um, companies to come together and with the one unique goal to facilitate and accelerate 
development, manufacturing, and distribution of COVID-19 therapeutics, vaccines, and diagnostic measures. At that time, directly from the CARES Act, which had just been passed in the United States, $10 billion of initial funding was made available to the Operation Warp Speed. This was going to speed up the, um, the development of vaccines and other therapeutics in US and across the globe. Third topic, innovation and adaptation. So I will not lie. This was us in the end of last February, about same time frame last year, early March. And we were in an utter state of denial. For a moment, we thought that this, this pandemic will, will just stay off to Asia. Uh, when we saw Italy, we thought maybe it'll not cross the Atlantic Ocean. And we thought, U.S. would remain, you know, aloof of this pandemic. There was associated anxiety. We felt time pressured. Well, it's drifting westward. Is U.S. going to be next? That led to a state of confusion. We obviously, like all of the nations, had no past experience dealing with such magnitude of pandemic. We were scratching our heads on how would we garner seed funding? to initiate research. I still remember the very first study we brought on and shared with our upper management. Um, they said, no, let's just wait. They had concerns for the safety of our patients and, and researchers. We had no idea what would this drug do? What would this, these investigation products do? And how do we even get started? There was truly a lot of uncertainty around pandemic exceptionalism. We knew it was exceptional and day by day that concept was getting uh, more clearer. But these were the set of initial responses um, at our research institute. And at that time, when we started looking at the numbers on March 19th, we saw the first 19 cases hit in Texas. The graph here depicts the number of cases which are the daily um, counts of new cases hit in the state of Texas from last March to as of February 7th, 17th. Um, December 15th, we saw our largest surge of over 60,000 new cases. <clears throat> and as early as last week, that has gone down, thankfully, to about 4,500 new cases. But back in March 19th, as we rewind, when those 19 cases really hit Texas, it was a wake up call. We prayed and reminded ourselves of our purpose. Our mission statement became a guardrail, which is to extend the healing ministry of Jesus Christ. Would God have looked away in such moments? Would he have stopped healing the masses? No. And our own vision statement of a research institute starts with the verb to continue. How could we have stopped? This gave us power in the most vulnerable times. And we immediately bucked up and came up with an operational management plan, which was a three-step process. We had multiple meetings, we had a lot of brainstorming sessions, we had physicians on the calls, non-physicians, our researchers, our executives, and our first step was to re-strategize. And we decided to delay, drag, or drop some of the non-COVID-19 clinical research activities, which in light of the current urgency could have paused or been delayed. Our step two was to come up with a research priority map to guide our COVID-19 research endeavors. And I'll show that in our next slide um, and we'll cover that there. Our step three was to come up with a new five-step site activation process plan, um, which would include a lot of modifications to the way we were used to doing research. So, Running a very large, very complex and sophisticated research institute calls for very rigid and structured processes. 
Um, and so we had to get flexible in everything we did to accommodate timely um, support for the COVID-19 research studies. Um, so this five-step site activation process um, had a uh, loosened steps such as um, waiving or delaying ethical training, which we require from every investigator before they can start a research study. We perform a very extensive and exhaustive feasibility review process before we uh, take on a research study. Um, that was consolidated. We even truncated some of these sections of this process. We modified our IRB review process. We added more meetings so these studies would get the ethical approvals in a timely manner. And we adjusted our um, contract review processes. We, we added additional support. We worked round the clock to provide support for this. And, and to review our measure uh, of performance, we developed a special in-house tracker to capture our performance for COVID-19 research activities. So again, desperate times call for desperate measures and we displayed exactly that. So here is the guiding principle that we have been living through since um, last April. Um, it is a five-pronged approach um, that we have committed our research institute to doing. The Orange bubble on the top is our efforts. We wanted to make contributions to the diagnostics and uh, the biospecimen research um, of COVID-19. Um, some of our work has led to um, FDA approval, the Food Drug and, um, uh, Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act uh, approval for uh, certain diagnostics that allow point of care uh, testing of COVID-19. So we're very proud of our um, um, work in that direction. We have worked on a lot of innovative therapies. And one of the examples we will talk today will be actually one of the innovative therapies. Um, and some examples of this are um, a, you know, looking at um, intravenous globulin or convalescent plasma and certain other products. We've also looked at uh, drug products, um, which would be used as a treatment for um, COVID-19 patients, such as remdesivir, acalabrutinib, and a variety of monoclonal antibodies. Um, we, in all transparency, have not been able to uh, make meaningful contributions to the vaccines and biologics development, um, but um, that remains to be part of our strategy map. And lastly, um, our safety studies, it remains a focus. So as time goes on by, as these uh, drugs and uh, biologics becomes available for our patients, uh, we wanna continue to um, make meaningful contributions for pharmacovigilance and surveillance type of research studies and phase four clinical trials um, down the road as part of this strategy map. So this has been the guiding principle um, for literally the last year and has um, allowed us to, to remain innovative all along. So now let's take um, an example, um, a single center experience um, that has allowed us to, to innovate, to truly adapt and achieve this level of research excellence. So convalescent plasma, uh, therapy. Um, clinically speaking, this is the life cycle of uh, this particular uh, therapy. Um, whenever you have a patient who have contracted COVID-19 and have recovered, could become an eligible donor for their plasma. This plasma received is called convalescent plasma. Upon received at the blood bank, it is then tested uh, rigorously for safety measures. It is then stored and transported to the hospital. Patients um, who are currently COVID-19 infected would then be transfused this uh, convalescent plasma received from someone who was recently recovered. The therapy is then completed and the expectation uh, or the historical scientific evidence um, at that time was the patient would show signs of recovery because they would have received the immunotherapy in a passive manner um, for their own recovery. And in future, the same patient who um, has now recovered can go back into the cycle and serve as a donor for future COVID-19 infected patients. So this is um, kind of a high level uh, science of passive immunotherapy. This was the very first study on a grand scale we took on at our research institute. 
Um, it was launched at all the acute care hospitals, uh, 25 of the 28 um, in our US domain. We, uh, as part of our um, plan, uh, provided expedited startup process. Um, there was a truncated, uh, a rather expedited IRB review. We had a very swift and a quick process for identifying and um, making these principal investigators um, eligible for the study. <clears throat> we developed um, operational workflow at each location. Now, each hospital is different. It's set up differently, um, uh, not just physically, but also the way it operates, even though they are part of Frista's health. So we had to come up very quickly with the operational workflow of how we would implement this research study at each location. Um, we had to develop uh, close partnerships with all the local blood banks, which were different in every different state and the city. We had to place internal controls to manage uh, study procedures and ensure that the data that was generated and collected was uh, clean and kosher. And then um, how would we assign team members for uh, obtaining the clinical data um, and then making these available to Mayo Clinic who was the um, major sponsor for this particular research study. So this was a five month performance um, in which we um, contributed to this science at our 25 different sites. So you can see in April we had, uh, so the dark purple bars depict how many patients were enrolled. And then the gray bar depicts how many of them actually were transfused. Um, so sometimes even after getting the patient consented to do the study, there were cases where uh, maybe the um, ABO matching was not available and we didn't have the right blood type of those patients um, available from the blood banks. That caused uh, the delay or ineligibility for them to gain access to convalescent plasma. Other cases, the patients unfortunately and sadly deceased after they were consented, but before we could make it uh, available from the blood bank to the bedside. So um, just looking at the numbers from April, just 32 patients enrolled to May 122. Um, we had a major spike in July 1529, and we ended the study in August with almost 2000 patients enrolled. Looking at the same metrics state by state, um, the distribution of the 2000 patients, most of them were from the state of Texas, uh, followed by Louisiana and then the state of New Mexico. <clears throat> the financial impact of the study was uh, to the tune of over $1.8 million to Krista's health. So not just the many lives that we were able to save in the very early stages of the pandemic, the many scientific contributions we were able to make, uh, but also financially speaking, we were able to uh, connect our uh, health system with um, either through reimbursements or cost avoidance in procurement of convalescent plasma from um, the blood banks through the participation of this research study. So innovation really um, seeks, um, you know, thinking outside the box um, and, and really having that um, clinical impact, the financial impact, the overall impact, and, and really um, kind of having that, that outside the box thinking. Along the process, we also were mindful of community awareness efforts. We knew as um, this pandemic was hit, and as we were very early on in these stages, our patients were, um, our communities and the patients um, out there had the anxiety <clears throat> about participating in research studies. There's already a worldwide anxiety about participation in research. So what we did, we partnered with our public relations office and we were on the TV. We were in every possible chance we could get our newspaper headlines. We were uh, putting out press releases. Uh, we did everything we could to make the communities comfortable that what we are doing is meaningful, it's in their interest, it is safe, and that they should come forward. Um, one of the stories here, this is a snippet. Um, you can see there's a lady here in a wheelchair. Uh, this is from our Marshall Hospital, um, where this lady um, took part, participated in the convalescent plasma research study. She was 95 years old, and she actually recovered and got discharged on her 95th birthday. And 
um, you know, we were able to make such harm, heartwarming impact in the patients in the communities where we serve. So it truly is a, a blessing experience um, having worked through these sort of research studies. Um, looking at our scientific contributions, this was one of the manuscripts where um, Dr. Srikant Ramchandruni and Palima from our teams were listed as the investigators um, and was published in University of Louisville Journal of Respiratory Infections. Just a few weeks ago, um, we also were very successful in having another peer-reviewed publication. This, um, you know, out of the box, focused on the operational side of things, not the scientific data, not the scientific evidence uh, that came out from the research study, but how a research institute came together in the most vulnerable times and implemented a sophisticated, a very complex research procedure um, and, and, and became successful. So this um, article kind of summarizes, celebrates that work performance, and we are very excited and proud of this publication. If you look at the regulatory impact of our work, um, in March 2020, Food Drug um, Administration issued the single patient emergency investigational new drug approval for convalescent plasma. The very next month in April, um, expanded access program um, was awarded to the Mayo Clinic. That is when Christus Health began a participation. And in the five months, um, 70,000 patients were enrolled across the US. As we saw in some of our previous slides, 2,000 of them uh, came from Christus Health. And it was at the end of August that Food and Drug Administration issued emergency use authorization to the convalescent plasma. So this brought a very, very major accomplishment to the COVID-19 patients because after August 26, 2020, convalescent plasma was made available outside the clinical trial landscape. Anybody out there who met certain criteria could get access to this life-saving therapeutic. And so as we come to an end of our lecture, um, these are some of the future directions that uh, we are continuing to make our contributions. We um, aim to make additional contributions to the science of passive immunotherapy. Um, past convalescent plasma, we are currently doing research studies on uh, intravenous immunoglobulin and hyperimmune intravenous uh, immunoglobulin, which is IVIG and HIVIG products, which essentially are the richer and, and thicker uh, concentrations of convalescent plasma with higher uh, perceived clinical benefit in the patients. Um, as you can see, there's a slew of um, continued uh, TV interviews on, on CBS channels and ABC and, and almost major um, uh, newspaper uh, headlines um, that is celebrating our work, uh, continued work, I should say, in um, finding answers to the COVID-19 research. We have also recently received a lot more awards. Um, again, that's uh, for future uh, presentations, but we are working on many studies that are coming out of Operation Warp Speed and are very excited to bring those NIH uh, dollars to Christus Health so we can advance uh, science, make contributions to the science of medicine, but also bring immediate benefit to the volunteer patients who wanna go in these research studies. So as we look back, um, and conclude our um, webinar today. We were able to um, just review the high level structure and scope of Christus Health's Research Institute. We took time to understand the theoretical concept of um, exceptionalism and particularly COVID-19 pandemic exceptionalism and its significance. We discussed the novel practices that our institute adopted, uh, developed to innovate adapt and achieve research excellence. And uh, we gave a research um, experience of COVID-19 convalescent plasma research study um, as a single um, site experience um, to further uh, you know, impress the, the topic at hand. And that concludes our lecture. Um, I'd like to now open the floor for any questions, but first wanna thank you for lending me your listening ear. Thank you so much, sir.
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure that you all will agree that this was such an insightful and knowledgeable speech given by our erudite speaker, Mr. Pukar Ratti. I would request Dr. Omkar Gurup to take up a few questions on behalf of the participants. Dr. Omkar Gurup. Thank you, Riti, sir. Audible? Yes, yes, sir. So questions are open now. Participants can put their questions in chat box. A very few questions I will be taking. Hey, Puka, very nice, uh, interesting, fascinating talk. Thank you. The question I have is um, now we are kind of uh, inclined and then we had a very steady slope and now maybe saturation limit we have achieved so far for this COVID-19. What is your projection? Where are we heading? We're certainly heading in the right direction. The biggest, um, you know, the breakthrough has been the development of a series of um, vaccines. Um, obviously, we want to have enough production and availability of these vaccines to um, hit the masses. We must reach 80% of the population globally, which is a major undertaking to achieve herd immunity, uh, whereby the, the, the disease itself will not be able to proliferate itself and uh, pretty much nip it in the bud at that time. Um, it will take us months, uh, maybe even a year to get to that level, but um, you know we have to start. And, and as I said, we are heading in the right direction. Also, the numbers have begun to drop um, in many nations, and that's another sign um, of, of us being in the, in the right, uh, right direction. Uh, if you take the example of Maharashtra particularly, till last week, the number was dropping and touched 2,000. But during last week, yesterday's number crossed 10,000. So, so how, how to control all, all these things? Right. So I think we have to really pay heed to the World Health Organization recommendations, the CDC recommendations, which is largely um, simple steps we all can take, you know. Um, I am vaccinated, my family is already vaccinated. We were the first in line uh, the moment we got the opportunity. Yet, we are continuing to social distance. We are not going um, out to social events. We are continuing to mask ourselves and really um, you know, taking those simple measures to prevent the disease. We all know how the disease spreads, which is through the respiratory droplets and masking is the answer for now. Um, either you get vaccinated, but even the vaccinated folks need to continue to stay masked and, and continue to have that social distancing, wash your hands. Those are the three simple, easier, um, very economical measures we all can take easily um, and save lives. I think it's, it's somewhat um, selfish for people who do not do that because it could be their parent, their, their loved one who could be next in line um, fighting with this life-threatening disease. Nobody wants to see that happen. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, Rupesh Kondeji have asked the same question and maybe Sir has answered that. So one uh, another question I would like to ask you, Sir. Mm -hmm. At present, are we uh, well acquainted with the information about how the immune system recognizes COVID-19 in the body and how it may contribute to the severity of the disease process? Means. What is the progress about understanding the immunopathogenesis of COVID-19 at present or until today? So that is definitely a work in progress. Every day, scientists around the globe are continuing to do so many clinical trials to generate additional scientific evidence and data in that direction. But if you look at the principle um, on which the vaccine was developed, it was largely on understanding the immunogenicity and the immune response of, um, of these products on these diseases. So um, that was kind of the driving factor um, and was the basis in the development of these vaccines. 
okay okay one simple another question that uh, will this covid 19 disease will go away completely or it will come everywhere like a common cold in winter season so um we have had coronaviruses previously so the 2002 was the the first pandemic um which was also coronavirus of course only 7 to 800 patients um around the globe uh, were diseased um off of that this is coronavirus 2 um it is said that this may turn out to be sort of a um influenza sort of a, a flu um sort of an event and um there is possibility that this may kind of linger for years and our bodies may just have to get accustomed mm. to this a uh, devil disease um and that being said there is possibility that we may have to come up with different versions of vaccines um that may last for only a couple years or in certain geographies and we may have to continue to get those booster vaccines year over year so in us we get the flu vaccines every year um this may be just another version of that unfortunately in the worst case scenario again we all hope in the scientific community that would not happen but um given the uncertainty uh, got to stay open minded yes sir oh thank you sir thank you sir i guess all the questions has been satisfactorily answered now i would request dr omkar gurav to toss a vote of thanks to our keynote speaker mr pukar ratti okay first of all good morning to one and all uh, honorable pukar ratti sir who is our first speaker of the today's conference uh, respected principal of our college dr sir patil sir the iqac coordinator dr arjun jhirange sir the conference coordinator dr mrs supriya shukla the convener of our uh, institutions innovation cell that is iic dr mrs sharda gadadi as well as all the members of iic the faculty joined over here student it is my privilege to have been asked to propose a word of thanks on this occasion this lecture delivered by honorable pukar ratti sir was indeed comprised of full of knowledge and interesting stuff and also we have uh, emerged about the covid-19 pandemic a most interesting thing it gave deep insights into the topic and also revealed some interesting facts sir has also discussed about his experience and the work which he has been carrying in the last couple of decades sir has done phenomenal work in the field of clinical research and uh, under the christus health research institute with more than 600 centers in usa providing high quality health care and improving the health of communities therein uh, sir is the best example one can look at about how to be creative and flexible about the work and also developing the ability to come up with the ideas and novel approaches to the problem so i'm pretty much sure about the precious knowledge uh, given by him in this lecture will be definitely help helpful to all the participants in their future endeavors so on behalf of bharati vidyapeeth dean to the university ashwantra mohiti college pune and the entire fraternity from different fields which are gathered over here together as well as on my own behalf i extend a very hearty word of thanks to honorable pukar ratti sir for gracing the today's conference and sharing with us your findings and significant knowledge we are very much happy uh, to have you here for this today's conference so once again i am thankful to you sir for uh, taking out time from your busy schedule and enlightening us with your knowledge thank you so very much very much appreciated thank you thank you sir with that gratitude being expressed we have now come to an end of our first session but before mr pukar ratti sign off i would request all of you to put on their videos so that we can make a memory of this moment by taking a group photo i request everyone to put on their videos so that we can take a group photo Dr. Prashant Patel. Yes, ma'am. Group photo. Is it taken? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Pukar Ratti.
And now moving on to our second session for which I would re request Dr. Shraddha Gadai, ma'am, to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Vilas Paul. Uh, good morning, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is my proud privilege to introduce you, uh, with Dr. Vilas uh, with all, uh, with you all, uh, with my friend and a great scientist, uh, Professor Vilas Poor, who set a new Guinness World Record for the fastest time to arrange uh, 118 elements of the periodic table. So, and his journey is itself motivating to all of us. Dr. Poor did his master's from Department of Chemistry, University of Pune in 1996. Then uh, did his PhD from University of Berlin, Israel. And also he has continued his postdoctoral fellowship at on dye sensitized solar cells at the Berlin Institute of Nanotechnology and Advanced Materials, Israel. Then he joined as material scientist lithium battery materials group at Ergon National Laboratory, USA. Currently, he is working as professor in Davidson School of Chemical Engineering, Purdue University, USA. Uh, Dr. Vilas authored uh, more than 210 research publications uh, with H index 46 and an inventor of 10 US patents with 20 applications. Uh, professor Poor's research activities are highlighted in different media, PBS NOVA, ABC7 News, Discovery, New Scientist, and Forbes magazines. Professor Poor delivered hundreds of invited plenary talks, including TEDx. Vilas is honored with Argan Scholar, Intel Prize, R&D 100 Award, British Carbon Society's Brian Kelly Award, American Chemical Society's Grand Prize and salutes to Excellence Awards, Material Research Society's Science as Art First Prize, American Institute of Chemical Engineers Sustainable Engineering Forum Research Award and Professional Achievement Awards, American Ceramic Society's Richard Fuller Award, the Minerals, Metals and Material Society's Best Energy Paper Award and a gold medal he received <laughs> in uh, sport. Uh, Purdue University honored him uh, with uh, Breo, Outstanding Engineering Teacher, Seed for Success, and Purdue Faculty Scholar Awards. Currently, Viper Laboratory, that is Villa Sports Energy Research Laboratory at Purdue University, Indiana, USA, is working on the development of longer life, safer, rechargeable lithium ion batteries for their operations at extreme conditions. The adventurous scientific life journey from Pune, India uh, to Purdue, India, uh, Indiana, USA, via Israel, with the power of unbound imagination for the transformative technological innovations. And he will discuss it in today's speech. With this tremendous excellence and encouraging journey of Professor Poor, I salute on behalf of Bharti Vidyapi Dim to be University, Eshwantra Mohite College. In spite of huge time difference, uh, he is uh, today uh, with us. Uh, currently uh, in uh, Indiana, it is a uh, midnight. So in spite of all these, uh, he is with us today. I welcome Vilas on behalf of our Institution Innovation Council and IQAC. Thank you. I request you to start the session. Thank you, Sharda. I am trying to uh, share my talk here. Can everybody see the slide number one? Good morning, Nana. Yes, sir. Good yes, sir. It's, it's visible. Uh, so, Sharda, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, you are one of the best classmates I have, and that memory again comes back after 20, 25 years. 
Uh, Avinash Singh is here too. And there are some re uh, relatives here, Apiksha Dumbre, Kamal Nalaude, Jabbar Sheikh. Uh, my brother just said good morning. So it is like a family. Uh, so it is a great pleasure to share with all of you uh, how wonderful journey it is. And it is not to tell you that how good am I, but in spite of that, I would like to inspire uh, our uh, colleagues, friends, students, in a way that there is nothing impossible uh, in this world. When we say impossible, actually it says I am possible. So it is possible for me to do it. So what we are going to do here is uh, see the journey where I am from farmer's family that most of us are sitting here. I think all of us have one or the other way some farming background. Uh, we used to have the white uh, bulls at home, uh, hawks, and we used to race with them at some point and I used to run behind them. <laughs> from there all the way to scientific journey, uh, you will be seeing uh, in this uh, talk. And I would like to have it interactive, not that uh, being a faculty or a professor, we should just talk. I have seen that you guys are still there and your cameras were on, so you did not disappear. You are still around here. I, some of you might be eating breakfast, but we can still talk. So this talk will be kind of question and answer, and not only one-sided, I will be shooting some uh, bullets. So let's start. I'm a faculty at uh, Purdue University. You will get to know what is Purdue University at some point. And I'm also a faculty of IIT Indoor. Myself, I never have been to any IITs to get education. Most of my Indian education was from Pune University followed by my PhD from Israel. Uh, but I am also a faculty at IIT Indoor and I do have a small research group and one faculty there uh, with whom I am collaborating. So let's start uh, with the journey. So the journey started from Pune, India. Uh, you can see here the map where we are here from Pune area. Uh, through this um, Arabic Sea, I went here all the way to Israel. Israel is a very small country. When I had to go to Israel, I had to really find Israel on the map. It is that small. Uh, the whole Israel, is as similar as uh, area of Maharashtra, but it is sci scientifically and technologically very advanced country. And then after the education there, I came to United States. So currently we are here in uh, uh, Indiana, close to Chicago. Uh, it takes uh, two to three hours to drive he from here to Chicago. So what we are going to do today is going to talk about who we are, what we do, and few of the example uh, with lots of picture actually. I made it uh, pictorial in a way that I can keep all of your attention for uh, let's say 45 minutes or so. So I will be showcasing that few of the technologies that we are developing, those are transformative, life-changing, and that can make some difference in our uh, society beyond our publication and patents that should have real value. So really this talk will be focusing on inspiring you, giving you an idea that you can do much more than what I am doing or what I can do or uh, so far it has been uh, happening. So before that, before the real scientific discussion, I would like to say Gayatri Mantra, uh, which is the origin of this whole universe. Om Bhur Bhuvasa Tasya Vitur Varenyam Bhargo Devasya Dhimahi Dhyo Yona Prachodayat This is the Gayatri Mantra initially created by Maharshi and the meaning of this mantra, not many of us are aware. That's why it is uh, given here. And the meaning says that let us meditate 
upon the glory of Ishwara, who has created this universe, who is fit to be worshipped, who is the removal of all sins and ignorance. May he enlighten our intellect. And this meaning is extracted by Swami Sivananda. So in India, we have a great library of knowledge. All of us not necessarily understand it, but if we understand it, there are plenty of things to carry forward and take it to the next generation. With that, I would like to begin. So the title of my talk is Innovation with Imagination. So one can make any kind of innovation if you have a imagination. What is imagination? Imagination is a dream, not that you see in the night time, the dream that you see in the daytime. With that dream, you can fly really, really high. As Einstein mentioned at some point, if you would like to have one discovery, you have to have minimum 100 good ideas for that. So out of 100 ideas, eventually one might work out and you will have that product that one can utilize. So keeping that in mind, we should not stop our mind thinking and creating innovative ideas that can change the world. And that is what the impact we are going to keep back when we disappear uh, from this world. This is all borrowed life. We are here temporary. Nothing is ours here. We are just here to travel, let's say 70, 80, 90 years. And then at some point we will be disappearing, but we will be making this world better for our own kids and the next generation. As everybody knows that need, whenever there is a need as we have seen in the previous talk, uh, COVID-19 hit all of us so badly, uh, it became a need to find the vaccination for that and then everybody just jumped and tried to find the solution for it. So, Garaz hi shodachi jananiya he, he pakta bridwa ke nauto phalavar lina sati, parantu indeed that is the key when the, where the innovation can be born. Uh, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam uh, repeatedly told us that creativity is seeing the same thing but thinking differently. For example, COVID-19 is everywhere in the world. Everybody knows the problem, but how we look at the solution, that is the most important factor. And with that factor, how we do find the solution, uh, that's the logical thinking comes into force and that becomes a winner. So I would like to ask you a question and anybody can answer. We don't have to uh, wait or I, I will not take anybody's name, but what is the most valuable thing in life? Any one of you? The life itself. Uh, you got the answer because I highlighted it in green. The thing is, you are alive now. You are still breathing. You still have a spirit. That is the most important thing. Now, what is the second most important thing you have? The growth and progress. Very good. How the growth and progress happens? With the money? <laughs> no, money doesn't do everything. Okay. We are all doing the same thing, but we are not aware okay. that reason. I'm putting this in a question so that... Through our devotion and work, maybe our health. 
natural resources with the trust to thinking virtues of life thank you very much sir ethics ethics Actually, is one of the important we are all doing the same thing but we do not know exactly we are what we are doing and how powerful things we are doing today and the most important thing you have is education with the education you can do everything that is impossible and that was impossible until now without education you cannot do that so who are our first gurus to give the education mother mother, mother. parents mother mother parents absolutely the first gurus are father and mother they are the one Uh, who teaches some in, in the beginning when you you are seven eight uh, months old how to walk you fall many times they again help you and teach you okay continue you we can do it and then thereafter they put you in the school sometimes they take your uh, homework sometimes they don't have time but they are the first gurus after that who are the second gurus teacher nature absolutely right so what education gives us all of us and what we are sharing all the faculties and students are here and i really want to elaborate that education gives us knowledge righteousness and courage to do the things money doesn't give that there are so many people they have plenty of money but not necessarily their kids did anything valuable they don't have any courage to do it they don't have the righteous energy provided to do that and if the education is missing the richer son or daughter they can't do anything significant in the society whatever significant thing happened so far i will show you few of the example where there was a scarcity of things those are the people who did significant things so let's move on the second gurus are our teachers and we are really playing all of us very valuable uh, work inspiring our next generation because they are the one to discover the things for the society it can be covid 19 covid 20 or it can be many more catastrophes uh, but who is going to solve that our next generation and to make that next generation fruitful teachers are playing very significant role elementary school teacher followed by high school and then college teacher all of them are really playing significant roles however it is in students hand how much they want to capture and what to do with that knowledge and education they are getting from the teachers so i just collected some of the images uh, some of my colleagues shared uh those images this is my elementary school uh, jivan shikshan mandir we had only two rooms and four grades first to four, fourth grade uh two teachers sometimes one teacher used to come one uh, teacher used to stay home so we were all having fun all the time in the class then uh, i had education in garge maharaj vidyalay othur actually my classmate uh, nitin patil is a uh, sanchalak director there now Uh, leading the whole school and you see that there lights he sent me the photo yesterday night this is a current photo so they really illuminate the minds of students and nobody knows which teacher can ignite which candle and what that candle can do then i had education in anasag wagari college uh, othur itself which is a nice college Uh, where i got uh, first rank in my bsc that made me to go to pune university where i met my colleagues uh, sharda and avinash and many others and again we all learn from the same teacher same information but everybody had a different imagination power and that's why we are landed in different places so 
you might recall this Pune University, uh, one of the wonderful place. Uh, I still remember it. All the degrees are collected from there. And they did such a wonderful job in my life. And I am transforming here in US, not only to, to the US students, but you will see that there are many Indians, Chinese, Korean, and Japanese. All of them are getting benefited with the education I got sometimes back. Uh, followed by that, after completion of MPhil from Pune University, I decided to go to Israel, which is a very tiny country. Uh, however, they are scientifically and technologically very, very advanced. For example, in 1972, there was a Israeli lady, Donna. She was the first one to figure out how the DNA and RNA strands look like. And she got a Nobel Prize for that in 2012. So being a small country, scientifically and technologically, they are indeed advanced. And that was the reason I decided to go to Israel uh, to uh, pursue my PhD and not to go to US. Uh, it has been very nice experience being there, uh, doing postdoc, and then coming to Argonne National Lab as a scientist. So my professor Gedan Kane and his spouse they are here, they were there during my graduation, which was one of the satisfactory moment in my life because I was the first foreign graduate student, PhD student for that particular university. Even today, they are so self-focused, self-centered and matru bhasha premi, namely they do like their Hebrew language so much they do write their PhD thesis in Hebrew. So some of the pages in my thesis are Hebrew language written. And I was only the first student who was allowed to write English thesis. However, they did a wonderful job in my career. Uh, I published uh, 20 plus articles uh, during my PhD and postdoc, and then moved to Argonne National Lab. As I mentioned a few times, gurus do play a significant role in our life. So after mother and father, uh, Professor Gedan Kane, uh, with whom I did PhD, uh, he had a significant role. Then Professor Doran Arbok, he's a great electrochemist. Uh, his first student is Ari Zaban, and he is a vice chancellor of the Barilan University now. So he, fabricated or manufactured a student or guided a student who became a president of the university in front of him. And then I moved to Argonne National Lab where I worked with Michael Thakre. This Thakre now name sounds to be Maharashtrian, uh, but this uh, Dr. Thakre is from uh, South Africa. He was scientist uh, and recently became an NAE member uh, so very high caliber scientist. And since they pay, played a significant role in my life and eventually everybody's life, there is a guru. So that's the reason we say Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo, Maheshwara, Guru Sakshat, Parabrahma, Tasme Sri Guru Venaba. He manyama go khup motha karan ahe ani he karan kaila sati apla la teoda shikshan gaila paichani. Anyway, after my uh, PhD, I moved to Argonne National Lab, just like our National Chemical Laboratory in Pune. There are 16, 17 national labs in America. The first one is located in Chicago area, established in 1942. And they are doing very good job on energy science. And I was appointed initially as an Argonne scholar, followed by I became a material scientist. And I will be sharing a few of the examples which were discovered there, just based on the imagination. So if you remember this nanoscience and nanotechnology, which was born in around 2000, uh, but the key message was given in a conference in 1959 itself by a physicist, Richard Feynman. And he's one of the 
sentence, striking sentence was, there is plenty of room at the bottom. That means if you really understand the science, if you want to really understand the science and technology, you have to go to the bottom. Bottom means at a molecular or atomic level of the materials. And therefore you have to put engineering, chemistry and physics together in a way that you would be developing successful scientific technology that would lead to uh, new discoveries. So some of the elements here are highlighted in white spots. Most of those elements I have visited and developed variety of materials for variety of reasons. So let me give you an example where we can make the materials. Those are all the traditional way that anybody can make. All the laboratories are equipped with those techniques. They do have some advantages and there are some limitation. For example, some of them are really tedious uh, methods to fabricate the materials. Sometimes you cannot scale up. Uh, you just uh, publish a scientific paper, but if it is not uh, producing the mass scale production, for example, COVID-19 vaccination, if you cannot produce enough uh, that vaccination and it is not provided to the people, that this discovery becomes useless. In order to make the nanomaterials effectively, I wanted to discover something new that is reproducible and anybody can do that. You don't have to have a PhD to make any nanomaterial from the periodic table that you can just name it. So Elon Musk, uh, most of you might have heard or seen his videos. He says that what makes innovative thinking happen? I think it's really a mindset. And you have to decide that. It doesn't matter where you are born, what is your background, uh, where did you get your initial and final education, it really doesn't matter. You just have a big innovative thinking mind and willingness, willing power to pursue that. He made this Tesla very successful. Uh, you might have seen the gigafactories are all over the world and he's the kind of owner or initiator of that. Uh, SpaceX, he developed where he sent the Falcon to Mars and from the space it left, same place it landed back. Such a accuracy, accuracy and precision one can achieve in the life. So really, innovative mind can do impossible things possible. Let's go back to the technique that I was talking about. I call it as dry autogenic reactions. What is dry? The chemistry is dry. You don't need any solvent. You take a chemical precursor from Sigma Aldrich or whatever chemical catalog you can get. And only one chemical precursor has multiple elements from the periodic table. It has carbon, it has hydrogen, it has oxygen, it has cobalt, based on what precursor you are picking up. And then I came up with the idea that why don't I have a reactor? I throw the precursor inside, lock the reactor and dissociate that chemical precursor. Being a chemist by training, I wanted to play with the chemistry. Uh, for example, in this particular case, I took a simple precursor called as allyl triphenyl teen. It has carbon, hydrogen and teen, only three elements from the periodic table, but one is from S block, one is from P block and other is also from P block. So in that particular case, you are allowing them to have the fighting with each other because you are providing enough heat to dissociate the molecule and eventually it is reaching the critical phase and then you allow it to settle down and you get a wonderful new material that was not born before. And each time you can make a new material and that has a fascinating property for your television screen your cell phone memory, your cell phone camera, you just name it, or cell phone battery. And you will be seeing few of the examples. So there was no reactor that I can buy. So I developed my own. It is called as high pressure, high temperature reactor. 
I call it as autogenic because it is a self-generated pressure. You don't have to put the pressure inside. You have a chemical molecule, you dissociate it uh, by heat. And once it is heated up, it creates more pressure and it grow, goes to the critical phase. So this is a critical phase environment where you can make unique material. And there are a variety of advantages to have uh, this type of reactor. And you will see soon that design unique materials that has unique properties for a variety of application today. So what it can do? Since it was designed for nanofabrication, so material has to be less than 100 nanometer diameter so that most of their atoms are on the surface. And once the atoms are on the surface, they will provide you unique properties that was not possible to achieve, for example, catalysis. Smaller the particle, better the catalysis can happen as you have more atoms to participate in the catalytic activity. So taking this reactor, we made phosphides, carbides, borides, nitrides, all kinds of unique material, unique morphology, unique architecture, and eventually we applied them in many of the uh, applications. Uh, seeing is believing. So here are examples. For example, our parents used to watch very big television, which used to have the red color, or sometimes it was just black and white, and then the color TV came after video con. So europium oxycarbonate is one of the material that emits red light. That was discovered for the first time in this reactor. Europium oxide was no, uh, known, but europium oxycarbonate was not known. Zinc oxide, uh, somewhat defective we made, so it can emit different lights from the same material. We made some superconducting materials, uh, such as magnesium diboride. Uh, we made some material that has uh, photocatalytic activities for solar cells, uh, for example, TiO2 based material uh, with some defects, so you can have the better solar spectrum uh, captured. We made material that can store the hydrogen, Back in 2000, 2005, uh, people wanted to do hydrogen storage. So that material was very useful. The batteries we have in your cell phone, those materials were produced in this uh, typical reactor. And I will be showing you only one small example with the help of video to save some of the time that you can use this reactor to solve the environmental challenges and problems that everybody is facing today. So when I teach science, I just do not bombard the knowledge because the picture can convince more than thousand words. So I started participating in a science as an art in worldwide competition. And all those pictures are taken by me in a microscope, typically scanning electron microscope that most of you are familiar with. And then we put the color in Photoshop. But those pictures are all award winning. Those are in uh, O'Hare Airport, uh, in many restaurants, and apparels, and shirts, and many places. Uh, so again, science is such a beautiful thing. Uh, once you have education, that will help you to decorate things in a way that everybody gets attracted to some, something scientific, but in an easy fashion, easy to grasp. So example I would like to highlight here is the plastic bags. You know that in Maharashtra, many times we ban and we open it up and we are still having it. So having plastic is not a bad thing. It is very convenient for the customer, but at the same time, it does not degrade for hundreds of years. We have less than 100 years of life. However, plastic stays forever. So there was a process developed, and I know that it is making a trouble to Bombay and many other places of India, as well as the whole world, we have to find a solution. So we just throw this plastic in the reactor that we developed, and it could make a wonderful new material such as carbon spherical bodies. You know that carbon 60 was made, graphene was made, Nobel Prize winning material, but there was no solid dense spherical carbon was made because carbon is a layered structured material, just like the bricks we have for the building. So how can you make the spare out of the brick-like architecture? But this reactor made it 
possible. And eventually that led to a significant award that is called as R&D 100 Award, where in the world, they choose only 100 technologies per year. One of the technologies was chosen. And sometimes back, back in 2005, six carbon nanotubes was a booming topic. Uh, we wanted to make carbon nanotubes from your trashed plastic bags. And you will be seeing that, how did we do that? Are you still with me? Yes, yeah. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are still yes, sir. with you. Awesome. So you are going to see one video that teaches you that how to make carbon nanotubes out of plastic bags that you are throwing away. Sir, video is not visible. Excuse me, sir. There might be connectivity problem. Wait. Video has not started with us. Oh, you cannot see the video? No, no, we cannot see video. Means on oh. screen we can see, but it's not running. Okay, it is running with me here. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. Uh, is there a screen issue that... Uh, so you have to uh, unshare and share it again. Okay, let me uh, uh, do that. Thank you for letting me know. New share. Not this one. Can you see the screen, big screen now? Yes, yes. No, no, sir. Actually, it's not a video screen. Oh, it is still not a video screen? No, sir, no. Screen over Kai, this at my age. Uh, um, let's see. What sir, you just uh, click on share screen again and you can opt for the top left corner option. Share your screen. It says new share, stop video. Uh, okay. New share. Yes, yes. yes, yes. Now, 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 it's... now it's visible, sir. Okay. Hello. Can you Sir, hear me? Or oh, video just open hours at me? Oh, no, 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 no,
जाऊ दे मग आपण प्रेझेंटेशन कंटिन्यू करूयात यू कॅन सी दिस व्हिडिओ ऑन युट्यूब एनी टाइम व्हिडिओ सेज दॅट वी लास पोल ऑन न्यू वा देर आर सेवरल अदर व्हिडिओ दॅट यू कॅन वॉच बट इव्हेंच्युअली वॉट इट इज शोकेसिंग इज दॅट यू कॅन टेक वेस्ट प्लास्टिक बॅग्स अँड यू कॅन मेक ए वंडरफुल न्यू मटेरियल्स जस्ट आउट ऑफ द वेस्ट वी आर कमिंग बॅक हिअर टू इनोव्हेशन so innovation doesn't have boundaries it doesn't have any limits uh, one can discover new materials very effective so mahatma gandhi was uh, saying that if i have the belief that i can do it i shall surely acquire the capacity to do it even if i may not have it at the beginning so actually in the beginning we do do not have that capacity but we can acquire to have it a uh, such a, a bold statement he made and it has a profound meaning here so let's move on the purdue university where uh, i am now currently uh, associated uh, purdue university is in indiana i joined here in 2014 as a associate professor and then became full professor uh, so this is a picture taken in a fall season uh, it's all uh, beautiful colors here in fall and all the colors all the buildings are having the brown color uh, on the surrounding so they look very similar to each other and this university is uh, ranked 114th in the world and in us uh, it is in top 55 universities you may or may not know that the first man who landed on moon do you recall his name Neil Armstrong So Neil Armstrong was a graduate student of Harvard University back in 1965 and then 1969 uh, when the Apollo 11 was sent on the moon he was the first person to go uh, on moon and land so Harvard University created such an engineer who can go on the moon for the first time uh, you might have heard bharat ratna cnr rao uh, sachin tendulkar and professor rao from bangalore they got bharat ratna award in the same year uh, he has some application with purdue university uh, so i met him in 2015 uh, when he was having collaboration with uh, purdue university he completed his phd in 1958 from purdue university material science department so the person who got a phd from here he can become a bharat ratna uh, a jewel of india that kind of scientist can be made or are made from this university just to give you some examples what is purdue university at purdue university uh, i have established a group uh, where it is called as a viper group uh, where those are the students and postdocs and scientists they are from all uh, different places and i am just giving the mentorship to them and they are the one to see uh, drive the discovery uh, with their uh, thrilling minds and you will be seeing some of the discoveries uh, pretty soon so what do we do on purdue campus we discover new materials utilize them for the battery application and make your today's lithium ion batteries safer than they are now so typically lithium ion batteries are the ones sitting in your cell phone now those batteries we are making safer than now namely if you have a electric vehicle which has whole battery pack you have such a huge amount of energy stored in that pack that drives you 3 to 400 kilometers per charge that could exhaust that or take away that energy any times so you have to have very safe measures on the top otherwise it is equivalent to the bomb and you are sitting on the top of it we are also looking at next generation batteries that is sodium potassium and lithium sulfur type of batteries that is very good to store your renewable energy 
that is generated from solar and wind and tides and hydrothermal systems. So we do have that energy plenty in the nature, but we do not know how to store. So those other new technologies uh, we are developing through, those could be useful. Is there a question? So let's no, talk sir. about the challenges we have in order to solve the batteries or make, make the batteries work. So the battery cost is very high. As you know that whenever you have to uh, change the battery, instead of changing the battery, you change the whole cell phone itself. It's not safe. So we are trying to make them safer. Uh, the life of the batteries are very limited. So we would like to make sure that battery can last up to 15 years. That is the typical life of the car that we are buying. And the battery should work at low and high temperature. And after the batteries are done or died, we should have a best recycling approach for the battery to get hold of. Now, typically what researchers are doing, they are trying to solve one problem and create many others. So being a scientist, we have to take into account all the problems together and then find a solution. Otherwise, our future will look like a broken glass. And we don't want to happen that. And that is the reason we would like to have the battery developed that has all the parts and all the issues taken into consideration. And that is what we do. So the batteries are having positive and negative electrodes. I will not put you too much in chemistry or electrochemistry, considering that you have different backgrounds. But all of us know that there is a positive and negative terminal. And lithium is the one that shuttles back and forth during the charge and discharge. So more the times it is happening, longer the time your battery will be surviving. So to make that happen, you have to have very robust anode and cathode materials. And that is what the new discovery we are making, uh, developing new materials that can do that uh, very effectively. So one of the technology I would like to highlight here is a separator that is in between the anode and cathode that we have developed. And that is now in the, some of the batteries that we are developing, uh, the company is using it, where the battery can effectively provide the higher charge, uh, making sure that your battery would not get discharged uh, in the afternoon uh, itself. Uh, the technology was developed uh, with a Korean scientist working with me in my lab, uh, Dr. Kim. Uh, he is a professor in Korea now, but he was a postdoctoral researcher. So typically, this is the separator you have it in your uh, battery. I will uh, explain in a Lyman term where the lithium ions are randomly going back and forth. If it is randomly going, then the lithium that goes randomly doesn't come back in the same position and eventually it grows like a dendrite and then make the battery fragile and break. So we, like, we wanted to change it to something very effective. So Purdue University Battery Systems Lab, that is our lab, modified the current separator, making sure that battery can last much longer. So the separator was designed where polydopamine polymer was coated on one side and the Nobel Prize winning material graphene was coated on the top and eventually these so bigger channels, micron size channels that did not be there, we have reduced that into the nano size, making the nano size channels for lithium ions to shuttle back and forth, eventually making your battery much safer and longer lasting. As I mentioned before, the technology has to go to the market at some point. So we could scale up this to make a larger rolls, roll to roll manufacturing in industrial fashion in a way that it can percolate to the batteries. So you can see that this is the traditional way your battery operates. The day you buy the battery, it has a good capacity. And every day the battery capacity goes down and down and down. Let's say in three years, 
half of the life of the battery is gone, only half of the capacity is remained. However, with the developed technology, almost 95% of the life after thousand charge and discharge cycle, it is still there where the discovery is very small, but profound, where we have manipulated the pores in the separator, which allows the lithium ions to shuttle back and forth effectively. We did not stay, uh, stay at the lab level. We made a bigger pouch cell. Pouch cells are the cells which are sitting in your cell for now, which is like, looking like a prismatic battery. And those cells were produced and Similar cells are in your cell phone now. Uh, those cells can give very high capacity because lithium itself is one of the electrode and the counter electrode is a cathode uh, coming with lithium cobalt oxide and other cathodes. So the separator technology we have developed, actually that did not stay in the lab, but it could power some of the toy trucks and show very effective capacity, not only at room temperature, but even at lower temperature. For example, if you want to go on the Mars and put this truck and take the photo on the Mars, the technology has to work at lower temperature. And that is what the solution we wanted to find out. The battery developed, it is working very well at room temperature in your house. However, we wanted to make it in different planet where the temperature could be as low as minus 120 degrees Celsius. And I will be showing you some of the data. Now, Dr. Abdul Kalam says that if you want to be successful, what are the things you need? There are a few things you would like to have. First of all, all of us have to have some ambition or the goal in life. Many of us, after getting the job, there is no goal, just teaching the same book over and over and going to the back and forth to the office, nothing more than that. But unless we have a significant big objective in the life, we might not be able to do anything remarkable. We will remain a small teacher, teach the same book forever and disappear at some point. But we have to have a significant objective. Once we decided the aim of life, then we have to continuously acquire the knowledge where this science and technology really uh, plays an important role. And the discovery comes only then when you continuously go on acquiring knowledge and implement to the particular topic. You also have to work very hard. Nothing comes to you without the hard work. At some point, we reach to the certain stage and we stop working hard. And then our scenario remains at the same place or maybe at some point even it starts going down because we do not continuously con continue to work hard. And we have to be having the perseverance as you will be failing many times, but for the committed man or a woman, failure is nothing. That is again and again the first step of towards the success. And that's why in order to really achieve the success, those four principles, all of us have to follow uh, effectively. Now I am going to show you another example here uh, briefly. Two years back in 2019, we wanted to celebrate 150th anniversary of uh, Mahatma Gandhi, birth anniversary. Uh, Purdue was also established in 1869. And this periodic table that everybody learned in high school that was also born in 1869, Dmitry Mendeleev, a uh, Russian scientist. 150 years ago, there was no internet. So he was not having all the elements ready. He was not having all the data, but he was the first one to put the elements in a fashion of a periodic table. In 2016, this periodic table became full. There are 200, uh, 118 elements in the periodic table. So it took us a long time, almost 148 years, to find all the elements uh, from the periodic table. Now, in these 118 elements, 90 elements are naturally occurring. For example, you have iron, manganese, carbon, hydrogen, those are naturally occurring elements. 
but some of the elements here, those can be only found in the lab. You cannot find them in the hill station. So whole periodic table was made. And this periodic table is really a key to the discovery. But many of us do not understand this periodic table. And we have to really understand this periodic table very effectively. And that's what the chemistry knowledge we had and we acquired. So in order to promote the science and technology to the student, I myself took a challenge and then decided to set a Guinness World Record. So the all scientific community where students want to learn um, periodic table, they can go and really see what are the properties, why those elements are sitting in their pr proper place, what is the pros and cons. Uh, so to do that, I started doing myself uh, some homework and decided to uh, establish this periodic table record for the first time. As you know that Guinness World Record was established in 1955. However, until 20, 2018, there was no Guinness World Record on the periodic table. So I was giving a talk at NASA Glenn Laboratory and then they said that, oh, you can set a Guinness World Record. So I started doing it myself uh, in a hotel room, uh, started with the papers from the hotel and I wrote the whole periodic table and mixed it up and it took me 27 minutes to establish and arrange all the periodic table. And they said, if you are doing it uh, less than 10 minutes, then it will be record. Otherwise it won't be a record. So there was a time, August 15, the Independence Day of India. The day came, uh, within two to three weeks, they said, okay, we will come and have the Guinness World Record set uh, in your university. So I wrote the periodic table without looking at the periodic table and convinced that indeed I know the periodic table and I can set the record. So it did happen that I had to have the tiles where the name or the element name were written and eventually I had to put it together in a way that the Guinness World Record would be set. So there were three story building where all the audience, students and professors, my colleagues, I was giving my own exam in front of them. And it is a big challenge for a human brain where there is 118 elements which are mixed up, where we have to put them together in its correct place. If you are not able to do it, you have to ship the whole periodic table back and forth and it could take forever. And in order to do that, you really have to understand that. And that's why the gurus and the education does help. And eventually it did happen. Uh, it did set in eight minutes and 36 seconds uh, and it became a record. So again, if the credit doesn't go to me, I want to send that credit all the way back to India and my gurus and my uh, teachers, such as you all sitting there, uh, who really train the mind in a way that there is really nothing is impossible. You can pursue the things that you dream for. So currently, what are we doing? So as I talk about uh, Neil Armstrong, who was the first man went on the moon, on his name, there is a building on Purdue campus. We also want to make the batteries that we have the expertise to develop the batteries. So some of the batteries we would, we would like to send on the Mars and make it work. Or if the batteries are there, there is a need of energy to store and utilize. So the submarine also need the batteries, but today's batteries are not good. They are not able to fur pop. So we have to develop an electrolyte that does not freeze inside the battery, even at minus temperature or even at higher temperature, it does not boil. So we made some batteries and I will be showing only one slide that the batteries are made in our group where they are working at 50 degrees Celsius, which is really hot temperature. And they're also working at minus 50 degrees Celsius, which is really, really cold. Your freezer temperature is minus two or three degrees Celsius. Minus 50 is really, really cold. So battery does function uh, with less capacity with the same charging rate, but we are able to develop the batteries and we have a dream. If there are 
there is a need to go on Mars and stay there. And if the battery has to be developed, our batteries could be the first to go there and help you out to provide the required energy. So you have seen this picture uh, many times. Everybody loves iPhone. He is inventor of the iPhone. Uh, I means individual phone, the phone which are taking almost 60 to 70 elements from the periodic table and becoming smarter than us. This was developed by the dream of this uh, person. And he says, if you are working on something exciting that you really care about, you do, don't have to be pushed. The vision pulls you. What is the vision? The imagination, the innovation you want to do, that should direct you the direction you wanted to go. And this Steve job is not anymore with us. He passed away uh, with cancer. But the food he developed, everybody loves it and everybody utilizes. So iPhone, iPad, everything starts with I, uh, developed by the imagination that one person had, and that is Steve Jobs. Uh, such a remarkable discovery he made and kept with us. So with that, I am going to stop here and give you some take home message. Those are all my words. It's you to make an impact. It is in your hand to create an impact and keep it behind you. In order to do that, you have to be strategic. You have to plan, you have to execute, and then analyze whatever you get and find out what discovery you are making, how helpful it is. You have to understand what is your strength. Everybody has something unique. We are all different. And because of that, we have a beauty in this world. So if we understand what is our strength and focus on that strength, we can make impossible things possible. Many times we don't believe ourselves. We do not know our strength. As you know that human brain has such a unique power. Scientifically, it is proven that we are using only 15% of our brain power. 80% power we are not utilizing. We are not really pushing the bound boundaries. We could do that. And beyond that, you never give up. If you really want to discover, innovate something new, keep it for the society, you eventually you will earn the money and whatever is required, status you will get, everything you will get. But your dream has to be really big. And once you start dreaming big, you will be able to indeed do remarkable thing that will keep a legacy for the future generation. With that, I'm going to stop here and take your questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, sir. That was a real treat to our ears. Uh, uh, social transformation is the motto of Bharti Vidyapeet and you have emerged as an example of translating it. Moreover, I would also like to mention that today, the day marks as the birth anniversary of Saint Ghargi Maharaj and you being an alumni of this school which has been named after Saint Ghargi Maharaj who has always devoted his entire life in the cause of social transformation. Thank you so much, sir. It was a great, great pleasure and we feel fortunate to have a scientist among us for this session. Now I would request Dr. Omkar Gurav to take a few questions on behalf of the participants. Okay. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are. Okay, okay. First of all, thank you very much, sir, for uh, such a wonderful and nice talk. And we are truly inspired by your this commendable journey about the research and becoming a scientist. So I will be taking a couple of questions from the audience. First is uh, uh, Rupesh Lodeji asking about what could be the reasons for more scientific temperament in Israel in comparison with India? Means where we are lagging in scientific innovation. Uh, 
Uh, we are lagging, frankly speaking, we are lagging in the direction. We have all the resources. We have the best brain needed to do the discovery, but the direction is lagging. Okay. For example, let me give a simple example, being uh, Maharashtrians, uh, typically farmers. We have a drip irrigation system mm -hmm. that drip irrigation system was discovered in Israel. And we licensed that technology from Israel to put it in our Daksha uh, and many other places, tomatoes. Uh, so why did they come up with a solution for that and Maharashtra or we couldn't come? The reason is Israelis are getting very less rain. So since there is a scarcity of rain, they realize that they have to find a solution. And they were the first one to really take a liter of water and make a drop, 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 and put it to your plants, making sure that when the plant need it, it get it. And only limited amount they have, so they provided the limited amount to the uh, plant. And eventually they are very successful. When I was there in 2005, I think Sharad Pawar and many other uh, ministers from Maharashtra, uh, they came to Israel to see the Israeli land and how the agriculture land is developed there. They have very small, whole Israel is so small, like Maharashtra, the whole area, and they have a desert there, they have the green zone, they have the Dead Sea there, so much diversity. But beyond that, they could develop significant amount of world-class agriculture there because of the vision and because of the need they had. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, maybe another question by Hulwale uh, Samartha. He's asking about why do lithium battery sparks when its outer covering is taken off? So, <laughs> lithium batteries has positive electrode and negative those two electrodes should not be together. They are always separated with a polymer called as polypropylene. Okay. Yeah. Polypropylene melts or if you are taking the outer electrode or outer shell of that outside, then eventually your anode and cathode is touching together and there is a local short circuit and that local short circuit leads to battery heat up and eventually there is a thermal runaway battery could even explode because it has a huge amount of energy that it want to uh, give up uh, and it could lead to the explosion. So one should not try to open the battery with a plier or a metallic thing. The metallic thing can put your anode and cathode together. That could lead to a spark. Okay, I hope uh, your question is answered well. Yeah, thank you, sir. Okay. So one small question from my side that what are the benefits of culture that encourages the creativity and innovation? Means, and your point of view, what culture would be adopted at a college level or any uh, institute to produce significant research outcomes and innovation in the concerned fields? So the culture should be very simple, straightforward, but it should be curiosity driven. And that curiosity is lost because most of the time we are looking at the phone which does not have anything. What we are discovering in the phone which is already discovered. Mm -hmm. so the information we have, we are misleading and misusing it. Mm -hmm. And our curiosity is going close to zero. For example, sometimes there is so much rain in Maharashtra or whole India and sometimes there is no rain. So you need a simple thing that one should look at that point very carefully and see whenever there is a rain, how can I percolate all that water in the land or whatever area I have? And if I am able to do that, then in summer, I don't have to go 100 feet down to find that water. In America here, we find water after three feet. Right. But how to have the bore well here. Yes, yes. All the water is percolated and stored. But we don't do that. All the water, we put all the roads everywhere and then how the water is going to percolate down. Mm -hmm. So those kind of things has to be really uh, carefully looked at and we are not doing that. The teacher, when teacher is teaching in the class, all of us, what we are teaching? 
we do not ask question ourselves what are the three things i am going to teach today that student will never forget and unless i do that i am not going to come back even if you do one thing per day you see how much benefit we can do let's say we are teaching thermodynamics many professor itself do not understand the thermodynamics and if we understand how much we percolate that to the student so we have to be a question based and student has to be like that student should really pay attention what professor are teaching and why they are teaching and what is the benefit for me why i am wasting my time sitting in the class yes sir so all those things are not taken care of very well for example when i teach class nobody can use the phone nobody can use the laptop they have to have full attention on the board or what i teach and if they know better than me then they go and teach i sit behind i am happy to listen so in that way you are really percolating 100% knowledge to the student who you are really deserve for and if they are not they are free to go outside the class and have fun outside so the curiosity driven age yes. and research is missing yes definitely india is spending a lot of money on giving the money to graduate student and iits are established everything is established and still we cannot make our own batteries we cannot make our own solar cells so the direction is missing the pilot is not having the correct direction yes yes indeed and one fellow is asking another question uh, that uh, uh, can you tell about the van de graaff generator is it practically used can you repeat the question please he wanted to know about the van de graaff generator and it's a practical use i don't know whether this question is uh, relative to the this thing no i i couldn't follow it what, what is the generated called van de graaff generator so van de graaff generator so do you know how does it function i am not aware of your van de graaff oh. okay any other question from audience a uh, one uh, fellow is saying uh, sarita how to be motivated all the time the simple question <laughs> how to be motivated all the time yeah. stay away from the phone you will be motivated <laughs> <laughs> less use of mobile phones yeah why would uh, mobile uh, phone <clears throat> proper use at proper times yeah so, but you see we have developed the phone what was the purpose of a phone <laughs> yes the purpose of the phone was to have the communication communication and yes, that yes. is doing it effectively yes sir but what we are doing currently is all of us become a uh, whatsapp whatsapp university managers and we are sending this person that message to this person but eventually what we are learning out of so the things you need for your life we are not learning that and we are becoming more interested in somebody else's life so that means in army language you are keeping your uh, rifle in somebody else's shoulder and trying to hit the target we will never hit the target if the rifle is not in your shoulder and in front of your chest yes so the education system uh, again it has changed because of this covid Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise indeed how many of us knows to take a equation mathematical equation and sit in front of it and put two hours of time to solve that as our patients we are not doing it correct right. so discovery happens because of the periodic table those are all the 118 elements everywhere in all the discoveries 99.99% do not know the periodic table and those people are the director of the institutes those people are going to give big talks but they don't know what is the origin of the discovery how to discover things so such people are leading us and that's why i said that the leadership is missing leadership is going in the wrong direction and that's why the discovery is not happening the way it should be
Vilas, can I ask one question? You can ask many questions. <laughs> yes, thank you. It was very nice talk and informative. I have one small question. You mentioned uh, separator between anode and cathode, and that time you mentioned graphene also. Uh, whether that PDA or uh, whatever the polymer, polydopamine or something you mentioned, is uh, was it uh, the coating on graphene or uh, uh, graphene was functionalized with, uh, while preparing? I mean. So actually, you, you are very curious and creative person. That's why you got that point. I really like that yes. question. So what right. happened is a pristine polypropylene separator that mm -hmm. has to be non-conducting. Okay. And we kept that non-conducting, but only one side of the separator was, modified. you can see the brown top portion, uh -huh. modified with poly polydopamine. So polydopamine yes. hydrophilic material, typically polypropylene is hydrophobic. It does not like the water, yes. but we made it hydrophilic so that the electrolyte can it, that can shuttle the lithium ion effectively. So the okay. same, it also helped us to narrow the bigger channels to smaller channel size. And our idea was to send the lithium back and forth effectively from the nano channels itself. Okay. Then we put the graphene on the top, only on the one side. If we code on the oh. board, then there will be short circuit. And uh, we yes. did in order to make the battery work at lower temperature. What happens when you put current or try to extract the current from the battery, there is a local heat. And that local heat will be dissipated with the graphene layer. And that way, electrolyte is not frozen. Otherwise, electrolyte freezes below zero degrees Celsius. And if it is frozen, the battery will not get current and you cannot run the device. So this architecture was done in a way that the whole discovery is in a way that the battery should be able to work at lower temperature just by the small amount of graphene addition, which enhance the conductivity of the electrode and eventually battery is working. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Vilas. You're welcome. Thank you, Vilas. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I guess all the questions have been answered well. Any more questions? Uh, con yes. Conclude the question uh, session. Okay. So now I would call Mrs. Ranjana Chauhan, Associate Professor, Department of Microbiology, to give away the th uh, thanks to Dr. Vilas Bo. Good afternoon. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mayuri. Uh, on behalf of Bharti Vidyapit Team to be University, and YM College, I would like to thank Honorable Dr. Vilas Kaur, Professor at Davidson School of Chemical Engineering, Purdue University, USA, for his valuable guidance and consenting to be the speaker of today's conference. Sir, your words have inspired our participants. Uh, I would like to say here that any reaction requires a catalyst and being a chemist, you are efficiently playing the role of a catalyst in the field of, field of chemical engineering and uh, innovative techniques. Uh, so I must mention my deepest sense of appreciation through your presentation you have made. Uh, our minds open and it is said that minds are like parachutes and they only function when they are open. So dear participants, uh, I would like to mention one more quote here uh, which is uh, by Albert Einstein, he has said that the true sign of intelligence is not knowledge, but imagination, I unquote. And this has been precisely done by Dr. Vilas Paul. Thank you very much, sir, for your motivation. Uh, coming to the end of this conference, I have been given an additional responsibility to propose the vote of thanks for this concluding session. Just don't leave and spare with me few more minutes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, 
on behalf of all of you a graceful and warm afternoon to the most valued speakers uh, mr ratti and dr vilas pol uh, in charge principal dr sr patil coordinators of this conference all the participants who have joined through zoom and youtube i mrs ranjana chavan associate professor department of microbiology bharti vidyapeets vyam college consider this opportunity as an honor and privilege to extend the vote of thanks once a great man whispered that feeling thankfulness and not expressing it is like wrapping a gift or a present and not giving it so today i take this opportunity to put all my gratitude into words as it is the remarkable day of our institute in hosting an international conference on innovative thinking in science and technology first i would like to thank honorable speakers uh mr pukaratti who is a system director research Davidson School of Engineering from Purdue University USA on behalf of the entire institute and Bharti Vidyapeet deemed to be university the participants from all over India and abroad i would like to thank both the speakers wholeheartedly i express my heartfelt gratitude towards the speakers for sparing their valuable time and sharing the knowledge and inspiring all of us in this pandemic situation ratti sir your work in the field of health therapy is really appreciable in a very short span of time it was a big yes from both of you speakers for this conference we will need your remarkable guidance and support in the future endeavor thank you very much i also take this opportunity to thank all our management team who, who are the backbones of our table chancellor dr shivaji rao kadam sir minister of state dr vishwajit kadam sir vice chancellor honorable dr saurankhe sir joint secretary of bharti vidyapeet honorable dr k d jado sir for their constant support and valuable guidance we have been fortunate to be assisted by our in charge principal dr s r patil for encouraging us thank you very much sir i also thank all the research scholars and students within india and डॉक्टर शुक्ला इंस्टिट्यूशन Innovation Council Convener, Dr. Mrs. Gadale, IQSC Coordinator, Dr. R. S. Zirange, all the teaching and non-teaching staff. Events like this cannot happen overnight. So, as the wheel starts rolling weeks ago and requires planning and bird's eye for detail, here we are fortunate enough to be backed by a team of dedicated members. So, I would like to thank the organizing committee members, Miss Desley, that is Mayuri. Mr. Kumbar, Dr. Patil, Dr. Guru, Dr. Jamdade for making all the technical arrangements and time-to-time -time updates and handling the online platform very efficiently. I cannot thank everyone enough for their willingness and involvement. 
lastly i would like to thank the social media the volunteers the student teams and all those who are directly or indirectly involved in making this event a grand success thank you very much i hand over to my thank you so much ma'am now i would request everyone once again to put on their videos so that we can take a closing group photo of the session everyone please put on your videos hello ma'am i'm apeksha i want to say something about dr vilas pol am i allowed to do that yes ma'am yes yeah. ma'am you can um, yeah i won't take much of your time sorry uh, i just wanted to say something about him so i know him very well from long time um, there is one quote from walt disney uh, he is a perfect example for it so if you can dream it you can do it so for me he is a true inspiration i learned one thing from him that that is uh, whenever whenever we can wherever we go in our life uh, we should not forget from where we are coming and the purpose why we started the journey so just concluding my speech that uh, we all are lucky to get his guidance that's all thank you thank you apeksha that was so nice thank you apeksha for that uh, have you taken a group photo yes yes yes, yes you taken photograph hmm. okay thank you so i want to make few closing announcements that the feedback form will be shared with all the participants through their mail and the certificate of participation will also be issued within two working days right so with that we conclude our international conference on innovative thinking in science and technology a sincere thanks to all of you for your active participation and cooperation i would also like to remind you all please stay connected with us through our social media handles do not forget to subscribe our youtube channel and do like our college page on facebook may you all have a productive week ahead thank you so much have a great time uh, just, a minute, just a minute you, just Paul, a minute dr pol thank you uh, thank you very much yes sir professor yes, pol uh, uh, we are sorry that uh, today you, you are late for sleeping night so so uh, we, we <laughs> really thank you for sparing your late night time and good night now <laughs> yes sir good night thank you thank you so much sir thank you sir thank you so much sir you all take thank care you all. good luck thank you sir thank you thank you sir god bless you all yeah. okay thank you thank you okay, sir thank you thank you very much sir thank you so much to all of you thank you poor sir for give most information important information sure you are welcome bye everyone with everyone's permission should we put an end to this conference yes yeah, please yes please. Please.